Thank you, Drew and Deborah. Good morning, church. It is a privilege to preach God's word to you this morning in Steve's absence. Steve and his wife, Lisa, are in the Middle East caring for some missionaries there, so be praying for them. I'll go ahead and ask you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We are in the Gospel of Luke this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. That is on page 858 in the Black Bibles in front of you. If you don't know who I am, my name is Adam Watkins, and I have the privilege of serving as the student director here for middle and high school students. And before I read the story, I'm going to tell you a story about when I was in middle school. I was 12 years old, and I was going into seventh grade at Drake's Creek Middle School. And in the first week of school, I found out that I had been invited to be a part of GT Art, Gifted and Talented Art. I wasn't really expecting this, but I was excited about it. It meant that I would get to go to the art room on Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. and do art with the other GT Art people. Kind of felt like a secret club, and I was excited to be a part of it. I was excited to tell my parents, thinking that I would get a congratulations. Uh, I saw my mom first that day, and I said, Mom, guess what? I'm in GT Art. And instead of congratulations, she said, Really? You're in? Uh, and I was like, Yeah. And I told my dad, thinking, expecting congratula- congratulations, said, I'm in GT Art. And he said, Really? Uh, and then a year later, uh, at Southmore Middle School, I made the basketball team, told my parents. They said, really? Uh, same year, I made the baseball team, told my parents, and they said, really? Uh, now, I tell you this story, not because I'm upset. I love my parents. They're wonderful. They're right over there. Um, but because in our story today, Jesus does something. He says something that his parents don't understand. Now, to be, to be fair, uh, my parents had every reason to be surprised. I got kicked out of GT Art the next year, and coming in at a whopping four foot 10 and 80 pounds in eighth grade, I never made another basketball team in my life. Uh, but Mary and Joseph, see, they have already been told some really, really significant things about Jesus. Leading, leading up to our story, they've been told that he is the son of God, that he is Lord, and that he will reign forever. You see, this this child is very significant, but Mary and Joseph don't, don't quite yet understand. And in contrast, the boy Jesus gets it. He knows, he knows who he is. And because he knows, because he knows who he is, he knows what to do. And so, This is God's word. Let's honor it by standing this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Every year, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? but they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart and Jesus 
increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. Let's pray. Lord, Father, so often we hear your word, you show yourself to us, but we don't understand. Open our eyes this morning, help us understand. Fill me with your spirit and help me as I try to preach your word. Amen. You guys may be seated. So the time is approaching for the feast of the Passover. And every year, Jesus' parents traveled to, to Jerusalem for this festival. The Passover was one of three pilgrimage events in the year for Jews, meaning that it required a journey, a trip to Jerusalem. And it's likely that every year his parents would have, Jesus' parents would have taken him with him. But this year is especially significant because Jesus, verse 42, Jesus is 12 years old. He's 12. And at 13, a Jewish boy becomes a young man. A Jewish boy would become accountable to the law. Today, when a Jewish boy thir- turns thir- 13, it's called his bar mitzvah. So this year, Jesus is going with his parents to Jerusalem, and it's a significant year. Maybe in preparation for his bar mitzvah, his parents are showing him all around the city. They're showing him the sights, all of maybe some new things that he's never seen before in preparation for the next year. And then after all of that, after those days were over, about seven days, about a week, the return journey to to little Nazareth begins. But Jesus, unbeknownst to his parents, uh, stays behind in Jerusalem. And his parent, but his parents don't know it because assuming that he was in the traveling party, they go a whole day's journey. Now how, how does that happen? The ESV translates this word group. CSB says traveling party. It's kind of helpful for us to understand how this happens, what happens. See, for, for these pilgrimage, pilgrimages to Jerusalem, whole neighborhoods and families would all travel together because it made it easier logistically. They kind of kept each other company, helped one another out, and they would all travel together, whole neighborhoods and, and whole families. And it's likely, R.C. Sproul says, it's likely that the way these traveling parties would work is you would have the women and the children in the front of the traveling party in this big group and then in the back you would have the young men and the men and so Jesus being 12 years old on the cusp of child and young man it's likely that Mary being in the front does not see Jesus and assumes that, okay, he's about to be a young man. He's probably in the back with his father, Joseph, and the young men. And Joseph, being in the back, not seeing Jesus, likely could have assumed that Jesus was in the front because he's 12. He's a child, he's with the children, and he's with his mother. But then at the end of a whole day's journey, at the end of the day, that's when these traveling parties would stop, and they would split up into their family units, they would set up camp, eat a meal, rest, and then they resume their journeys the next day. And it's at this moment that a perhaps a humorously familiar conversation between Mary and Joseph takes place. And Mary maybe walks up to Joseph and says, hey honey, uh, where's Jesus? And Joseph says, I don't know where he is, I thought he was with you. He's, he's not with, no, he's, he's not with me. I thought he was with you. Wait, so wait, we don't know where Jesus, yeah, I thought he was, with, no, I thought he was with you. So Mary and Joseph have lost the son of God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> several, several of you, not with the son of God, but maybe with your own children have unfortunately maybe know what this feels like to think that everything is going about normally and then suddenly you realize you are without child. So naturally they are a little panicked 
They can't find Jesus in any of the family camps. They're asking their relatives and their friends. At this, it's this moment that maybe a friend or family member asks the classic question when anyone's looking for anything, where did you have him last? Uh, so light bulb, they go back to Jerusalem, a whole day's journey back to Jerusalem, and they anxiously search for Jesus a whole day in Jerusalem. So it's been three days since they've seen Jesus. Imagine the anxiety and the distress of not knowing where your child is, especially this child, for three, for three whole days. And then finally, in verse 46, after three days, they find him. And it's here that our story breathes in, breathes in a little bit before it resumes. In verse 46, they find the boy Jesus in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at this 12-year-old boy's understanding and his answers. The story takes a breath here I think to remind us of something. To remind us that this 12 year old boy is special. At 12 years old, he is astounding the teachers and the scholars, the PhDs. There's something significantly different about this boy. And so now, We plunge back into the anxiety and the distress of Mary and Joseph, who have been looking for their son for three whole days, wondering if they will ever find him again. And when they see him, they're astonished. And in verse 47, they say this. They say, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Another time when I was 12 years old, I was at home. I think it was the summer, and I decided that I was going to go take a shower. I thought that that was a normal thing to do. I didn't tell anyone I was going to go take a shower. Looking back, I should have, because while I was in the shower, unbeknownst to me, a massive search party for my whereabouts had taken place. Uh, My... My, they had searched all over the house. Uh, they, they couldn't find me. At one point, they found my phone. Theories were developed that I had run away and left my phone, and they didn't understand why I was doing this. People were confused. Friends were being called. It was mass hysteria, and then eventually, I walked out of the bathroom. Uh, and I think my mom heard the door click, And so she turned on her heels and she comes bounding toward me and her lip is quivering and she's crying and she says, there you are, I found you. And naturally, I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. I started freaking out. I started crying. What have I done wrong? Uh, And it turns out that they had just forgotten to check the shower or the bathroom. Uh, After that, I always announce my intentions to go take a shower. (laughs) But in this story, in this story, Jesus, he does not respond in the way that I did. He does not freak out because he's not doing anything wrong. The first point of this sermon is that Jesus knows who he is. He knows who he is, and he's acting Accordingly, and I think he's a little surprised that Mary and Joseph don't understand. Because in verse 49, our story comes to a climax. Jesus reveals that he both knows who he is and he knows what he's doing. And it's very, very significant. He responds to his parents' distress and anxiety with this. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Jesus knows who he is. So who is he? First, he's the son of God. Notice the contrast here 
between Mary's question and Jesus' response. In Mary's question, she says, her statement, she says, your father and I have been searching for you, talking about Joseph. But Jesus, in his response, says, I must be in my father's house, talking about God. Why else would he call the temple, the place where God dwells, his father's house? Jesus is saying, and he's aware of, the fact that he is the son of God. And to say that he is the son of God is to say that he is God. If you're using children's bulletin this morning, that's the first sub-point, that, that Christ, he, he is God. And he is the son of God. He, the, the boy Jesus is Lord of all who holds the universe together, who is infinite in wisdom and who's perfect in love, who's holy and righteous. And so does this, does this begin Jesus' career as prodigy boy who dwells in the temple, who astounds the teachers and the scholars? Does this begin the Jesus who shakes off the authority of his parents to pursue his true identity as son of God and God himself? No, it, it doesn't. Why not? Isn't Jesus too good? You know, to be held back by his human parents? Wouldn't they slow him down? No. Jesus doesn't do this. Why? Jesus doesn't do this because, because he knows who he is. He's God. He's the Son of God. And third subpoint under who Jesus knows that he is. Jesus knows that he's a human. He knows he's a human. There's a tension all throughout this text. You may have noticed it at the beginning that Luke calls Mary and Joseph Jesus' parents. He does it three times in verse 41, his parents, verse 43, his parents, and verse 48, his parents. Now, Mary, it, w- it would have been more correct, proper to say Mary and Jesus' adoptive father, Joseph, but that's not what the text says. It's correct, but the text does not, does not say this, and it's, it's there for a reason. See, Jesus is a human, 100%. He's a human. How else do you explain that in chapter two alone, he goes from being a baby to a child to a boy? In chapter three, verse 23, he's a, he's a man. And the end of this story tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And that would seem to imply that to increase in wisdom would mean that you had to to learn wisdom. This is a very very human thing to say, a very human verse. And so what what do we do now? What do we do with that? Jesus' parents don't understand. Verse 50, they, they did not understand what he said to them, and they won't understand until much later. But what, what, do, we, what do we do? And it's, it's here that we have to hold together this tension that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, and he's both of those things all the time. I'm, I'm not here to boggle your mind this morning, but I am here to tell you to trust what Scripture says about this. Go study it if you're curious. Ask someone about it. And most importantly, under, understand, understand why it's important for Jesus to be fully God and fully man and to be both of those things all the time. You see, Jesus is human, because it's a boy sitting here in the temple. It's a boy. It's a boy who used to be a a baby, but he's grown up, and he's a unique boy. He never sinned because he's divine, but he suffered and was tempted without sin because he's human. And here in the temple, we see this special God boy with special knowledge. Some commentators have helped me see that to realize the significance here, we have to think about, 
We have to think about the fall. We have to think about Adam and Eve's sin. So after Adam and Eve, after Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into the world and it separated us from God and it affected everything. It affected our hearts, it affected our souls, it affected even our minds, our intellect. But here in the temple, we see a boy whose knowledge, whose mind, whose intellect is unaffected by the effects of the fall, by the effects of sin. Just like humans, just like humans, because he is a human, Jesus has to study and learn and memorize, but he does so without sin. I think that's how he knows this stuff. He has a mind and an intellect that's unaffected by sin. And it's this reality about Jesus that makes him so important and so capable of saving humanity. You see, all of humanity has fallen short, has sinned, but not Jesus and not boy Jesus. You see, it's, it's really, really important that Jesus enters into humanity fully, 100%, no shortcuts, and that he does that without succumbing to sin or its effects. Jesus knows this about himself. He knows that he is God, that he's the son of God, and that he's human. And because he knows who he is, he knows what to do. So what does he do? That's the second point. Jesus knows what to do. What does he do? He does three things here. He obeys his father with a capital F, his father God. He obeys his parents and he grows. In verse 51, Jesus goes down. In verse 41, Jesus went up, but now he goes down with them. The son of God humbles himself and he obeys. He's submissive to his parents and he increases in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and people. And why does, why does he go down? Shouldn't he stay up? No, why? He's being, he's being a human and he's being a human in a way that is not subject to sin and to its effects like you and like me. In the words of Hebrews 5.8, Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. In the words of 2.17, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. See, in our story, Jesus says that he must, that it is necessary for him to be in his father's house. And this is not the last time that Jesus will say it is necessary for him to do something. In Luke 9, 21, Jesus says that it is necessary that he suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. You see, Jesus' unique identity as son of God, fully God, fully man, and his unique relationship with God mandates that he be in the temple and that he do exactly what he did, that he, that he live a perfect life as a human in obedience to his heavenly father and to his earthly parents and then die not as a consequence of sin but to take away death humanity's consequence for sin and then rise because death could not hold him because he's sinless and the life that he lived can be ours his record can be ours if we turn from sin and denounce it and trust in Christ the son of God he's the only one who can save you and he saves you by living, dying and rising and conquering sin and death. Jesus knows who he is and he knows what to do. Mary does not understand this, but she keeps it in her heart. If you're familiar with this, you've seen this phrase before. 
In Luke 2, 19, after Jesus is born, Mary treasures up those things in her heart. And in Elizabeth, when John the Baptist is born, people say that they keep these things in their hearts and they ask the question, what will this child become? What will this child become? Now, parents and church as a whole, can you relate to that question? Have you ever thought, what will this child become? Our seniors, do you remember when they were just little babies, right? And they maybe, maybe they did something that was funny or they laughed or they looked at you in a certain way and you catalog that away, you kept it in your heart and you think, is this, is this who they're gonna become maybe? Is this gonna stick? Is this them? Is this their personality? And then maybe they're 12 and they start to have their own interests and form fr- and, and build friendships and maybe have a personality and they do something that you don't understand and, and you think, is this, is this gonna stick? Is this who they're gonna be? What will this child become? And then now these seniors are about to graduate and go off to, to college and I imagine that our parents are thinking, you know, what, what will this child become? What will this child become? And my question for you this morning is what, what do we want them to become? Who do we want them to be? If I, even if I stacked up all the evidence of how we, spend, how we spend our time, what we talk about, what we do on the weekends, what we prioritize as it pertains our child, what would that communicate about who you want your child to be? I think this text tells us that more than the next best athlete, more than the kid with the solid career right out of college, more than the kid with the ring by spring, more than the kid with the best grades, we should want our children to find their identity in being a child of God. See, the most important thing about Jesus in this passage is his relationship with his father. He's God's son, and that drives everything that he does. He knows who he is and he knows what to do. You find your identity in being a child of God and then you go and do everything else from that. You go and make those hard decisions. You build relationships from that identity. Students, children, that's what you pursue. Parents and church, that's what we promote and encourage and pray for more than anything else. And, and last thing, this is for seniors, for students, anyone for that matter. Jesus is God's son, so he grows. He increases in favor and stature and in favor with God and with people. Now this verse is almost a direct quotation from 1 Samuel chapter two, verse 26, and it describes Samuel. And in its context, that verse contrasts Samuel with these wicked priests named Hophni and Phinehas. Now, Hophni and Phinehas, they're proud. They're, they're wicked. Their dad is a priest, and they're in their office for power to do what they want. And they don't, they don't respect the Lord. But in contrast, this boy Samuel... See, he's born from these humble set of circumstances. His mom was barren. She couldn't have kids. But she pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord gave her Samuel. And Samuel worships the Lord and serves the Lord. And while Hophni and Phinehas are doing what seems right to them, Samuel grows. And despite a culture around him that does not respect the Lord, Samuel continues to serve the Lord and grow. Now, in Luke chapter two, we meet a boy who's born in the lowliest of circumstances in a manger in Bethlehem, and he starts to grow. He increases in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people. And the very next verse, 3.1, introduces some people who are proud, who want to appease people and keep their position, Pilate, Annas, Caiaphas, to name a few. 
the very people who will have Jesus killed. But in contrast, Jesus is growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So, seniors, students, when you find yourself in a culture that doesn't respect God, what do you do? You grow. Worship the Lord. You increase in wisdom. You fear the Lord. You ask questions. You read the books that I'm giving you today. I think, and one of them is a Bible. You increase in stature. You take care of yourself. You eat. You sleep. Jesus had to do those things too. You increase in favor with God. You get to know him better. You learn what pleases him. Not to earn anything, but because you love him. And you grow in your favor with people. Not people-pleasing, but you see, Jesus earned the favor of the people who were outcast, who were sick, who were lowly, who were sinners. Those are the people that Jesus earned the favor of. Seek the favor of people by sharing the good news with them. See, the culmination of Jesus, of Jesus' favor with God and with people, it comes at the cross where Jesus pleases his Father and he dies for his friends. See, in Isaiah 53, 10, Isaiah says of the suffering servant, the Lord was pleased to crush him. It was God's will to crush his son. And the boy, Jesus, who did his father's will by being in the temple is the same man who would do his father's will to suffer and die on a cross to save the world from their sins. Jesus lived and he died and he rose so that we could be children of God. So does Jesus have your favor? Have you looked on him who for the joy, not just the obligation, but for the joy set before him endured the cross? Do you love him? Have you given him your life? Have you become his child? Do you know who you are? Do you know what to do? Find your identity in being a child of God and let that be the most important thing about you and let it guide and direct everything that you do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for a boy who had to be in his father's house and who grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man and with people so that he could be our savior, so that he could do what we could only do imperfectly. Lord, we pray that we would let the most important thing about us be that we are children of God, that we would receive the invitation that Jesus gives us by his grace to be a child of God and to let that guide and direct everything that we do. Lord, may we worship you with thanksgiving and gratitude. Lord, I pray for these seniors as they go into the next stage of life. And it's in your name that we pray, amen.